All right, welcome everybody to Net DevOps Live. We are here for our season two talk four episode of Net DevOps Live. Embrace the dry principle with network configuration templates. I want to thank Brian Byrne for joining us today and sharing such excellent content that he's pulled together for us, and we'll be going through all that content today. So as we get started, the one thing we always like to ask folks is to make sure that you head on over to DevNet and sign in so that we can track our interest in Net DevOps Live. You can do that by easily visiting the cs.co slash NDL link, which I'll drop in the chat momentarily as we go through. This just helps us understand all of the interest we have in Net DevOps and so that we can continue to bring you such great content. Now, as we go through today's session, if you have any questions, please be sure to drop those into the Q&A panel. I'll be manning those and answering them throughout today's webinar as it goes in. As always, the first question is always, where can I get the content, the code samples, and all of that great information that Brian is sharing? And those are already posted up under the webinar resources for today's episode. I'll drop a link for that directly into the chat as well in just a second. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian to dive right into the content, and we will see you on the other side. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Hank. So real quick, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Brian Byrne, and I'm what Cisco calls a technical solutions architect, uh, which really means I'm a pre-sales resource uh, assigned to roughly about 160, 170 of Cisco's largest customers based in the Midwest. And I'm helping them transform their network, whether it's from a LAN, WAN, or wireless perspective. And one of the pieces that I'm actually very excited about, and I spent a lot of time talking with customers, is they're working through that transition, it's, or that, that transformation is moving away from kind of the traditional way we've configured devices, or our network from a device by device perspective, to moving towards embracing more automation principles. And to that point, we're gonna talk about the dry principle today, and we're gonna talk about using how we can leverage network configuration templates to make this happen. So from an agenda perspective, what we're gonna walk through today, we'll talk about the dry principle, and we're gonna talk about the foundations for reusable code. If we wanna talk about reusable code or using code to configure the network, we have to understand what those individual components are. Then we'll spend some time, and probably the lion's share of this presentation, we'll talk about how we can use Jinja to create CLI templates, getting away from using Notepad with Control F, Control R to find and replace those configuration pieces. We'll briefly touch on how we can use YAML to read in that data. So if I'm gonna have a bunch of variables in a template, I need to have a way to actually pass information in so I can build out that configuration that I need. And then after that, we're gonna talk about something that's probably new to a lot of people. Actually, frankly, until I started digging into this section or this session, TextFSM was new to me as well. But TextFSM allows us to take semi-structured input and genera generate structured output. And I love that term, semi-structured input. And we'll talk about what that looks like. We'll dig into how we can actually use a Python tool called NetMiko to drive into that. <clears throat> so that point, the idea of, of dry, and, and dry as an acronym stands for don't repeat yourself. And I have to admit, I'm a little embarrassed. Um, I actually have been begging Hank for an opportunity to talk about this session for probably about 12 to 18 months, but I kept calling it my Jinja session, my Jinja session. So Hank finally put me on the schedule to do this and he sent me the title and it was this idea of embrace the dry principle. And I'm like, that's great. I have no idea what it is. So I went out and as anything, I went to Wikipedia and did a search. And there's a great article that's there and it's a, there's a whole book around the progr programmatic pro uh, programmer, too many Ps today for me. But the principle states, every piece of knowledge must have a single unambiguous authoritative representation with a, within a system. The way I like to look at this is I wanna write something once and I wanna use it multiple times. And I think that's probably the easiest way to pull that down. When we start talking about taking our, our dry code, so we're trying to get away from this idea that I'm going to essentially define everything specifically in maybe that Python output that I want in place, including all of my data that I have in place. So if I wanna change an IP address, putting that directly in the code. And I wanna separate code from data is really what I'm driving to. We're trying to get to less and less code and more pieces that we actually feed in that that code can execute off of. But kind of as I said, the genesis for this started a long time ago. It was a much simpler time in 2017 when Hank reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to talk about RESTConf, NETCONF, and YANG at Cisco Live. And I would have loved the fact if Hank would have reached out to me because I was a phenomenal programmer, but the reality was is I was actually very new to this topic. And the reason he asked me to speak around, around this topic and kind of helping customers make this transition to this point is I really represent that traditional network engineer. I've got a long service provider background in BGP and QoS. I've been building CLI. Most of my scripting or kind of the, my basis for scripting was writing TCL scripts as part of my CCIE lab exam. So it was about this time, about 2017, about two years ago, he sat down and he said, look, this is easy. I'll teach you the basic concepts and then I need you to go write a lab. 
So we went through all the material and I sat down and I spent six weeks kind of building some very basic Python code to write some labs. And it was great. The lab I thought was going to be a hit at Cisco Live. And then the day before I actually left for Las Vegas, I went to go start the lab and I was going to run it through start to finish for the first time. And I realized I had a problem. And this was my lab topology. I had a virtual router running on a laptop and I needed to configure two IP addresses. And I realized that all the time writing these examples where we were going to use NetConf to go out and use Python to query a device and pull in information, I never once thought about how I was going to go through and configure not only my laptop, but the other eight laptops that the students would be running in their session. And what's, I could have actually just created some, again, some notepad, notepad templates and pasted that information in. The problem was is that I had to run through this process start to finish in 15 minutes. That was the time between the start of the session and the end. And as anyone who's actually ever seen me speak before, I really probably needed to do it in 12 because I need that extra three minutes as I tend to talk a little bit longer. So faced with this challenge and not having a whole lot of programming background, I spent the first day or kind of the first half a day floundering around as how I was going to get this to work. And I realized, like any intro programmer, I was going to do the best thing I could and I was going to cheat. And the way that I cheated is I actually opened up Postman and I used Postman. This is actually part of the lab. I used Postman to generate a REST call to configure that device or to configure that interface. And I used the little secret code button and it generated this Python code. And if you notice, this is not very good code from the standpoint that I've got this variable for payload. And if you read through all that information, there's a whole bunch of information, but it's got things like IP addresses and, and net masks and these details that I needed in place. And I needed two interfaces, so I did what anyone needed to do in this case. I copied that file, I renamed it, and I replaced the value that I needed to create my individual, my, my unique or my interface three config. And the way I tied all these together is I used Bash. And again, I'm a Bash expert from my service provider days. I understand Bash very, very well. Python was, was new to me. And I just created a very simple startup file that called these two Python files. I executed them together and it went off without a hitch. The labs all provisioned correctly. I got them done in, in time. But when I went back and kind of reflected on what it was that I did, and frankly, it came up a couple of weeks later, I found out that this is actually was a failure from a long-term perspective. And what I found is actually I did such a great live at, or job at Cisco Live. One of my customers was there. They saw it. They asked me if I could come in and provide that same lab to everyone else in their environment. And as we were building out this information, the problem that I ran into or I found is that because I was essentially writing code for a very specific task, that when I needed to move this into their environment so we could do some lab testing in their environment, it didn't work. Essentially, I had to start over from scratch. And I love this quote. I talk about this all the time with customers, and I think this is, succinctly summarizes where we're at. Humans are not good at managing complexity. They're good at finding creative solutions to a problem of a specific scope. I had a problem. I was supposed to get on an airplane in roughly about 12 hours. I needed to get something running. I got it to work. The problem was, is the complexity of being able to do it again is where everything kind of fell apart. And this is where kind of this idea and I started looking into how do I, can I start using templates to start creating overall configuration? So we have this very complex definition of what a template is. And again, this is pulled directly out of Wikipedia under the idea of, of what a network or what a, a, a programmatic template is. But I think for most network engineers and we work under this idea of what a template is, it looks a lot like this. So again, we probably all have this. We've got a notepad file saved on our hard drive and we know that anytime we need to go in and configure OSPF, I open that file up and I find these double carrots to the side or kind of find this representation that I use that tells me I need to go in and I need to change these values and I can add in my information and I can cut and I can paste that into a router. The problem is, is this isn't very, very reusable. In fact, I know it's not very reusable because typically what happens is I'll save it before I actually retract all that information. So now no longer can I look for these, this term replaced or these double, the, these double brackets that are there. But what I end up having is I've got to go through and edit all that information out. But really when we start talking about a template or in this term, we're talking about this as a foundation for a reusable template or a reusable piece. I want to be able to use this programmatically multiple times. And the foundation for reusable code really kind of breaks down into three key pieces. The first is I have to have a scripting language. If I'm going to script out a change in the network, I need a language that's pretty self-explanatory from that standpoint. The two that kind of have defaulted into a lot of people's uh, mind, first is Ansible. And, and again, if you've got familiarity with, with Ansible, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, is particularly around Jinja and YAML, you probably used it before. But Ansible is a very simple scripting language for making changes. But also Python, and because this is DevNet, frankly, we like to talk about Python a little bit more because I think it provides a little bit more flexibility. We'll talk about all of our examples in Python, but we're using Python in a lot of environments because, frankly, it's just a very simple, easy-to-use programming language for people that are trying to get started. 
But we can also carry that out to further steps around something like Cisco's uh, network, uh, or the NSO, the Network Service Orchestrator, which is a larger orchestration tool that I can still use to create templates. But again, I have to have a scripting language of some type. Now the next piece are my templates. And again, pretty self-explanatory. This is a, a session that we're gonna be talking about templates. But these are just reusable configuration or operational command sets. Now I'll use these terms today, configuration and operational, but just think about it in terms of when I talk about configuration, we're gonna be talking about making changes to something in config T mode. Operational is gonna be essentially exec or maybe show outputs. And the reason for that is the tools that I use to configure or read the device are gonna be different based off of kind of what, what those libraries are programmed to do. But at the end of the day, these, these tool sets or these templates are really nothing there. There's a, a logic for substitution or reading out of the, these values as part of it. And some examples, we'll talk about Jinja 2, we'll talk about text.fsm. Notepad's there, not because I want you to use Notepad for, for any specific reason, but again, it's a point of reference as to kind of where these terminologies exist. And then lastly, I need to have some level of structured data, whether that's structured data to send into a template to generate configuration, or semi-structured data that I need to pass into a parser so I can pull out information, so I can parse out all the, the, those details as part of that. We've got a lot of different tool sets that we can use from this. We've got dictionaries, lists, comma-separated comma uh, uh, values, or YAML files as well. We'll briefly talk on YAML. So with that, let's actually jump in to start talking about how we can use one of these templating tools, or specifically Jinja, to create CLI templates. Now, one thing I want to reference before we go any farther, and I'm glad I remembered to do this now rather than as, as opposed to the end. So we're going to talk about how we can use both Jinja and TextFSM to interact with CLI devices today. And we're going to talk about it in a lot of terms of Cisco tool sets. But one of the great things when we talk about Jinja or we talk about TextFSM is these are truly multi-vendor tools. So the CLI template that I'm going to use in this templating language that we'll talk about, I can use it to create a Cisco router configuration. I can use it to configure a Cisco ASA firewall configuration. But I can also use this to configure something maybe for Arista or for Juniper from that standpoint. So just understand, I'm going to give you the Cisco point of reference on this. But again, this is a truly, these are multi-vendor tools from this perspective. So Jinja templating, um, I love this phrase. Again, I, I've got some of these bolts here because I love the terminology. It's one of the most used templating engines for Python. The reality is that Jinja is probably the de facto standard as we start talking about using templating for creating a device level configurations with Python for network devices. So it's based off of the Django fr uh, templating framework set, but it's a very simple templating language. And we'll talk about what that language looks like in just a minute. That we, we have a, a representation for variable substitution and then I have logic built into it for loops and conditionals. And those are really the two pieces that we use. There's an idea of inheritance where essentially I could say at the end of any of my templates, just make sure that I stick this level of detail that's there. We're not really gonna cover that today, but we're gonna, we'll talk about how I can create essentially one small piece of template and then pass it over multiple interfaces. And I can have a conditional essentially to take different outputs based off of what I'm passing in. Now, how do I install Jinja? It's very simple. I just do a pip install off of uh, within my Python environment, and it's actually a pip install Jinja2 is the actual formal name, but, but Jinja. We've got a URL that's there for the entire documentation set. The doc set's actually really, really good. Some great examples that are contained there within. So when we talk about this templating language, so what we've got here is if we take a look on the right side of the screen or right side for your presenter over here, this is a Jinja template. And we've got a couple of interesting characteristics that are in place. So I'm gonna ask you to skip past kind of the first two lines. And I want you to take a look at that third line that's indented that I've got a two curly brackets. So curly bracket, curly bracket, and I've got member.name. This double curly bracket is a representation of a variable. So at its core level within this templating language, we're gonna substitute what those two curly brackets represent with a value that we wanna pass in in this case. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind as we talk about this. So I need to do double curly brackets. We have to do double curly brackets. I'm gonna stress that again because I can't tell you the number of times I've written a template where I've only maybe put one of the two in place and then I've spent a significant amount of time looking for that needle in a haystack. So just get in the habit of that double bracket piece. And in my case, I do double bracket space and then my variable. That's optional. I can do double bracket and then just rent, connect that directly to my word and then close it with my double bracket. It's an optional piece, whether you're more comfortable putting it all together. I like the white space because it makes it a little bit more easier to read from my perspective. Now, the, the next piece that we have along with this is we have logic or expressions that are in place. And if we look at that, let's take a look at that top line, the curly br bracket percent, and then on the far side, I've got a percent and a curly bracket on the other side. That's a representation of a logic statement. So anytime we see curly percent, we understand that's logic. 
Double curly, that's gonna be my variable substitution. And in this case, what I've built is I've built at a high level, we'll kind of talk through what this is. I've got, I've got my input text that I'm passing in. I'm passing in some names and some instruments. For those that really understand, this is the Ramones that we're talking about here. So I'm gonna pass in the first name of someone in the Ramones and the instrument that they play. And I want that output to give me a textual representation of something that's human readable that says who in the Ramones played one instrument. Very simple piece. Now, one thing that we have to talk about, and this is the scenario we'll talk about from the first line. So the way that I pass this in, so I'll pass in all those names and instruments in, into, my, into my template. And in my first line, I have my for loop. So this is my loop that I have. So for member in band members, so for my list of band members, for each individual line, I'm gonna take this next series of actions. Now, I start with this curly percent four, and at the bottom I have a, a curly percent end four. My end four states that's the end of my for loop. So I'll process everything that's gonna sit in part of that loop for the individual lines. The next piece down where I have my if and else statements, this is my conditional. And specifically in this case, I'm using a conditional because of some quirks with language. So when I talk about someone playing an instrument, I can say that Didi Ramone plays the bass. That's a natural human language piece. But if I were to tell you that Joey Ramone plays the singer, you would probably look at me a little silly. That's not a phrase that we typically use. Someone is the singer, they don't play the singer. So in this example, this is where the conditional logic that's built into Jinja comes in. So if members instrument double equals, so this is the Python conditional for, for, for equals, equals singer, I'm gonna send that out to be their name is the instrument. If it doesn't match that singer instrument, my else statement, their name plays the instrument. So again, I've got a very simple logic structure in place to understand that based off of what I'm passing in, I want that output to be a little bit different. So again, very simple, and this is at its core, this is Jinja that we're looking at. So not very complex to actually build a lot of these configs out. So at that point, let's actually take a look at using some of, the, some of these examples with creating some CLI output. Now, a couple of things as we talk through this, actually before we get into this, um, what we're gonna be generating today is not necessarily configuration to send directly to devices. We're gonna be sending a lot of this config details out to essentially to output to the command line on the, on the device so we can take a look at it. So what comes out of these Python scripts, you should be able to cut and paste and dump it directly into a router or a switch. Not necessarily what we want from an automation perspective, but it'll help us from the lab perspective. And the other thing is, please don't ignore the fact that there's example one. I actually ran through this presentation a couple of times yesterday and it was a little bit longer than I needed. So the, the, the additional examples are all hidden as part of the slide deck that Hank's gonna post up to the, the Net DevOps Live site. But let's walk through an example here and what the output of this will be is I'm going to be configuring a VLAN and the SVI interface associated for that VLAN. So again, probably a pretty common task, something that we've all done on our network at one point or another. So the first thing I want to do is we, as we read down through, and we'll probably only call this out once as we walk through the code, but from Jinja2, so from the Jinja2 library, I want to import the template function. So I'm going to bring in template. This is what's going to allow me to build out the templates in my environment. And to that point, the first step that I do when I'm going to use Jinja to build a configuration is I have to define what that template is. And in this case, I'm defining the template directly in the code base. Again, not a very dry function or not very dry principled. This is actually wet, we enjoy typing. But I wanna walk through this as an example so we can see everything on a single screen to kind of understand what the flow is. We'll start to pull pieces of this out and make our code a little closer and closer to dry as we work through this. So what I'm doing, we'll talk through this first line, VLAN template equals, so a variable of VLAN, template. So I'm using that, that template function and I'm defining what I have in my parentheses there, that is my specific template. So if you're familiar with creating a VLAN, we know that the, the, the command structure is VLAN and a number, and I've got a name and an output that comes along with that. So what I'm doing here is I have VLAN, double curly's ID, so my variable of ID, and at the bottom I've got name, VLAN, double, double curly's ID. So I'm gonna use that same value of my VLAN ID number that I'm gonna pass back through. So that's one template. My next template, my SVI template, same thing, I'm gonna define my template, and that's gonna be interface VLAN foo, I'm gonna put in a description in place that's gonna have that VLAN ID in it, and then I'm gonna pass in my IP address and then my, my actual address and mask. So my variables are address and mask. Make sense? All right. So my next line, so I've defined my template, and the next line is I'm going to build my template or I'm going to render my template with the variables. 
So again, I've got some new, some new v, or, uh, variables here. I've got VLAN output and SVI output. And then what I have is if we look at this next structure, so VLAN template. So this is the variable I defined in the previous step that's going to represent my template. And I'm going to render, that's my action essentially. I'm going to pass in what's in the parentheses into that template and do my substitution. So in this case, that variable of ID, I'm passing in VLAN var. Now, where am I getting VLAN var? I'm actually specifying that higher up in the code. So my VLAN var is gonna be 101 in this case. So what happens when I process this with Jinja, I will take that template and I will substitute any place that I see ID, I will pass in the value of 101 back. And if we look down through to our SVI output, again, the next level down, the same concept. I'm using the variable I defined for SVI template and I'm going to render in the values as part of that. And again, my VLAN ID will be, or my VLAN var will be 101, and I'm gonna specify my IP address and mask. So once I've rendered my templates, I'm gonna process that output. In my case, I'm just gonna print that out to the screen. And what I get is a configuration that looks very similar to what we have. I've got my VLAN and my name, I've got my SVI interface, I've got a description, and I've got an IP address. It's a foundational piece of reusable code. I've created my templating language to build that. All right. So let's build up on top of this a little bit. So looks very similar to what we had in the previous example, but what I'm doing differently here is I'm not actually reading the template that I'm reading in. I'm actually calling an external file in this case. So I don't want to, I want to dry out my code. I don't want to start typing kind of all of my logic directly into my code set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually read in that file or that template file. So I've got that stored externally. So what I have here is with open and I've got my file name as F. I'll define my variable and I'll take that template. So I'll bring in my template of f.read and I'll generate this output. So I'll do this for VLAN in temp and SVI in temp. So let's take a look at what those templates look like. And again, this should look very similar to what we used in the previous example. Again, I'm just gonna do a variable substitution for, what, for, this, for ID, for IP and for mask. Now, one thing I do wanna call out, in my examples, I'm actually using this kind of name.j2, and I'm using j2 as an extension. This is optional, this is something that I, I do. I think it's, I don't wanna say a de facto standard, but I've seen a lot of others in this case. I'm using the j2 extension just as a representation that when I look at a directory structure, I know what that file type is. You can really call it anything you want to from that perspective. So, we read in these files, we create our variables for what's gonna represent our template. And very simply, I'm going to render those templates. So I'll do my variable substitution based off of those values that I have earlier up in my code. So I'll render in that template. I'll replace those, the ID I'll replace with 101, with IP I'll replace with 192.168.1.1 and on. I'll process that output. And what gets sent back out as part of this after I run that code, again, looks very similar to what we had in the previous example. All I've done here is actually just disconnected that template from the code. So we're starting to dry that code out from that perspective. So let's add a little bit more complexity into it. And that great, the example that we had was awesome. If all I'm doing is configuring a single VLAN and I'm configuring a, a single you know, layer three interface that's gonna be associated with that. But what if I wanted to configure multiple interfaces on our device? Now, we're gonna pull out the VLAN aspect of it and we're gonna really focus a little bit more specifically around just creating our layer three interfaces as we're just trying to make some of our output a little bit smaller. But if we look at here, the, there's a couple things I want you to notice first as we take a look. The first is, my template, so my code base got a little bit smaller because I don't have any many, as many actions that I'm gonna take in place, but I have this big chunk at the top and this is my VLANs equals. And what this is, is this is a list of individual dictionaries. So I'm passing in uh, list instances that are a dictionary of what that interface representation should be. So we'll talk about how I'm gonna read in all that information in just a moment. But let's take a look again at just specifically this code base. Now, we talk about the code getting easier. What this configuration now looks like or from a code perspective, this is roughly what, about four lines of configuration to generate an output that's gonna configure a layer three interface for me. And this is something that I can reuse over and over. So very similar, we're gonna start seeing this is gonna sound like a dead horse a little bit as I repeat myself over and over. I'm gonna read in that template. So again, my, uh, my template underscore loop dot J2, I'll read this in as F. And so I'll bring this in as F dot read. So template F dot read to bring in that template. And now let's take a look at this. Now again, if we think back to our Ramones example, I have to start off with a loop because I have multiple instances of data that I need to parse through. So I start with my for loop. So for VLAN in VLANs, my variable that I'm passing in for substitutions will be VLANs. And what I have is we take a look through, let's skip this generating line. If we take our, our next look down is we've got our VLAN 
VLAN dot var, VLAN var. What this is saying is essentially that first piece, so the right hand or the left hand of that dot is my individual instance in the list that I passed in. And the, and the right side of that dot is the individual key value pair, the value that's associated with the VLAN bar key coming out of the dictionary. And again, this template now looks very similar to what we had in the previous example. In fact, I just took that previous example. I brought that over here. I combined those two templates together to have a single piece of config. And what I, all I'm doing is I'm going to iterate through that list of, of interfaces that I had defined in my code, and I'll pass that information through. So I'll, I'll pass all the way through that. So I'll start with, for my individual instances, once I pass through that kind of that IP address line, the next, uh, the next uh, uh, operation that's in my, my code output is end for. So I'm going to end the for loop. I'll go right back to the, to the top and I'll start processing down for the next instance in my list. Once I'm done, I'll end, I'll end up my, or I'll, I'll process all the way through and, I'll, I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll move on to my print statement. So what I'm doing is I've read in my template I'm going to pass in this VLANs list, and my VLANs equals VLANs in this case, so that's my variable. I'll iterate through each one of the instances of that list. So I'll provide all those details, and I'll generate my configuration output. And this is the output. Now, I want to specifically call out something that I did a little bit differently in this configuration. You won't see me do this anywhere else. But if we look at the top between our, our left and our right-hand side, on the right-hand side, is that, or pardon me, on the left-hand side, as I was defining my operations, I defined those operations in the format of curly percent, whatever my operation was, percent curly. And what happens in that case is when I iterate through that template, any one of those lines in my template that actually had an operation, what the template sends back or what the template renders back is essentially a blank line. And the output of that is kind of, we look at my output in this case, and I'm only showing two of the three interfaces here, is I see a lot of white space that's part of that. I'm not a big fan of white space. The way that we can counter that white space in our output is if we take a look on the right example, I open up my operation with, with uh, curly percent, I've got my operation, and then I do a dash percent curly in that case. What that tells Jinja when I'm rendering the template is to not include essentially a blank line for that operational line that's in, that's in my output. So again, that could be helpful in certain cases where I want to actually include that line if I'm trying to debug uh, you know, what my template output looks like. But I prefer to actually use the dash. Just understand that this is optional in this case. So if we see something different, I just want to make sure that you understand why that's there. So... Again, if we talk about kind of building on those previous examples, what I had is if I look at my, my previous example that I had where if I'm going to pass in a list of interfaces, isn't that great? If all of the interfaces need to be configured in the same manner. But I'm not sure about anyone else, but it's pretty rare that I'm asked to do the same thing 100 times over. There's typically variations. As much as we try and drive standardization into, into things, we end up having a little bit of snowflakes. Or if I look at a switch, actually the port types on a switch may be a little bit different. So in this example, what I want to do is I want to actually provide a, an interface level configuration based off of some values that I'm passing in as part of this config. So very similar to the previous example, our code base is really, really small. In this scenario, though, I do want to take a look at what we're passing in as part of our arguments in this case, or what we're passing in as, as part of the variables that we'll do our substitution. So again, I have my list. In this case, I've got, I've got five, inst or five instances in my list. Each one of those lists are an individual dictionary. And what I'm passing in in this case is I've got my key values, so I'll have one for my interface name. The next level is the mode that I have, so whether this is an access port, a trunk port, or a routed port. The VLAN that I want to pass in is part of this. And the state that I have, and the state is going to be enabled or shut down. Maybe one of the interfaces that I want to bring up as part of this script, I want it to be set in a shutdown state because I'm not turning the device up on it until maybe the end of the week or something similar to that standpoint. So what we're really representing here, though, is I've got different parameters that I need to configure on a per interface basis. And I don't want to generate a new template every time I run through this. So let's take a look at the code. Again, the only thing that replaced from example five to example four is the name of the template that we're using in this case. So again, I'm going to read in that template and let's take a look here. So in this previous example, we look, our code is really simple. There's not a whole lot going on here. But when I move over to the template, I start to get a little bit of complexity in the template. Let's actually walk through the logic that we have in place. It'll make a whole lot of sense. But the idea is, it's, again, if we go back to that dry principle, I want simple code. I want separation of my data from it. And my data in this case is going to be the template. This is where all of my complexity is going to be in place. 
So where I'm going to start with again from the top, we're going to pass in, we, we'll see, we saw in the previous line, my variable that I'm going to use, I'm going to pass in ports. So again, that's going to be my list of, of individual configuration components. So I'm going to pass in ports and this is going to, I'm going to start with my loop for port in ports. I'm going to walk through and this is going to be my first level of conditionals. And I actually have two levels of conditionals in this place. So for anything that's assigned to an access or for an access port, I want to assign the VLAN. So if we kind of take a look through this yellow block that we have, if we read down through, so if port.mode double equals is the, is the Python conditional for equals access. So for anything with that key value pair of mode equals access, I'm going to send, I'm going to build the configuration switch port, the mode, so access, VLAN, and pass in the VLAN number. So this would be switch port, uh, switch port access VLAN 10. Then I'm going to manually hard code spanning tree port fast because I want those access ports to have port fast. Now I get into my second level of conditionals. So in this case, so if I match access and if I match these next set of values, I'm going to take a different action. So the first one, if my port state equals shutdown, I'm going to set a specific description and I'm going to shut down that port. Now I'm setting a specific description on these interfaces. So that if I go back and troubleshoot something at a later date or someone says, hey, this, this interface is down, I've got something that kind of tells me why that port may, may be in a short shutdown state. This is something that I do in my environment. So for the next line, so if I, my port state equals shutdown, else if, so if it equals shutdown, I do A, or if I will do port, uh, if it equals enabled, or if, if the port state equals enabled, in this case, I'm gonna set my specific configuration line and I'm going to set that to no shutdown because enabled, I want that port to be up. So again, I'll shut a port. If it's set to be enabled, I'll turn a no shut in place. Or else, again, this is my kind of my catch all at the end. If I do anything besides a shutdown or enabled, I just want to set that port to a shutdown. Maybe I'm concerned that the person who input the data or kind of built out that file for what those variables are going to be didn't necessarily knew what they were doing or I had concerns around it. So in this case, I just want to shut down that port and I'll go back and I'll troubleshoot those problems at a later date. So that's my second level of conditionals. And then if we notice at the end of that, at the bottom of that purple box, I have an end if. So I've closed out that second level conditional in this case, because that conditional is only going to apply for my access ports. So now I'm back to that initial if loop or my if conditional. So if port mode equals access, I take all those previous steps. If my port mode equals trunk, I want a different level of configuration. So in this case, I want to set my switch port mode to trunk. So switch port mode trunk, spanning tree port fast trunk. And I want to set my allowed VLANs in this case. And all that is, is that's, that's one of the key value pairs that I had as part of that textual output. I want to pass that information back in, into, into my configuration. Again, so I've got my if for it's an access port, my if, if it's a, uh, if it's a trunk, if it's not either one of those values, this is my, again, my catch all at the bottom with my else. If it's not either one of those val values, I'm going to consider that to be an invalid port type. I don't want routed ports on my switch. I don't want weird L2TP interfaces or GRE tunnel interfaces on my switch. So if it's not an access port or if it's not a switch, I don't care what you try and configure on that device, what you're passing in as part of that script. I'm just gonna shut down that interface and we're gonna go back and address that problem. So again, what I have at the bottom of that is I have an end if I'm closing up my, that conditional that was access, trunk, and then everything else. And then at the bottom, I've got my end for. So again, I'll iterate every one of those list instances all the way through this list, and then I'll use that to generate my output. Now, how do I fill in all those blanks? It's no different than anything we've done in any of the other examples. I've got my config in, and I'm gonna render all of that information based off of the variable that I pass in for ports. When that's done, I'll print my output and I'll generate my configuration output. So as we kind of walk through the logic, let's kind of walk through again, just a representation of what this looked like as we step through. So my first port, it's set to access. I've got a VLAN and my state is enabled. And if we look at the output that was generated as associate switch port access VLAN 101, my access in VLAN were two of the variables that I passed in. I'm setting my very specific description. So this was explicitly defined and I'm setting the no shutdown value on this interface because enabled was one of the conditions that I had as part of my loop. It was the second condition in my second tier conditional. 
For the next interface, Gigabit Ethernet 2, again, set to access VLAN 201, and I have this as shutdown. That was the first condition and kind of within that access layer conditional loop that we had in place. And again, my configuration that comes in is I've got a shutdown state, and I've got my specific description of port shutdown in data set. If I look at interface three, similar to the previous example, except my state is now set to up. That was not one of the conditions that I had matched. This kind of fell down to that else statement at the bottom. And the output that comes out of this is again, I've got my description, interface set down due to, to invalid input, and I set the shutdown value of the interface in that case. Lastly, if we go look at uh, uh, interface four, and again, in this case, I set my mode to routed I only wanted to have this process for access or trunk ports. So again, I'm gonna shut down that interface. And then lastly, my last interface that I passed back through, this was my trunk. And notice, I actually had a unique key value pair in this case for allowed. This was the allowed VLANs that I wanted to pass back through as part of my configuration. So again, we based off of that one single template, I was able to actually generate five different interface configurations, and I could use that pretty much to catch any type of kind of uh, option that I would need for for my uh, for my for my individual device config. So, very simple. We've simplified our code drastically. We pulled out most of the data out of this, but if we look at it, this kind of big piece that we have here, this blob of of, of device level configuration, it's pretty wet. Every time that I wanted to go through and run this script against the switch in my environment, I had to open up the code and type all this in. Probably not the most efficient use of kind of dry or reusable templates. So how do we address this? And we address this by taking structured data and passing that into our configuration. And this is another one of these cases, it's almost the de facto methodology for kind of passing in uh, uh, values in, into our code, but using YAML. And YAML, again, it, it stands for YAML ain't markup language, not yet another markup language. Uh, if you talk to a programmer and you actually tell them YAML or, or yet another, they'll, they'll jump all over you. It doesn't make sense because Yang is yet another next generation. So we can't get any consistency in programming or on our CLI structure, something that we have to deal with. But YAML at its core is nothing more than human readable data structures that applications can use. So this is very similar to what a YAML input would look, look like. If you've done anything with Ansible, you'll, this looks very familiar, kind of how you pass some of those values in as part of the config. So let's talk about how we can use YAML to feed in the details. Now, the first thing that you'll notice is one, we're bringing in a couple of additional Python libraries. So across the top, a couple of things, again, we still have our Jinja 2 and template. We're bringing in our YAML structure. So for, uh, import YAMLs because we have to tell our code how to work with that YAML data structure. We're gonna use arg parse as well. And what we're gonna use arg parse for is how we execute this script. We're gonna pass in the value of the YAML file that we wanna have. And then actually I've got pprint on here and we're actually, I ended up pulling the pprint config out. So just ignore that line. So now the code looks a little bit more complex. I added this big chunk at the top around argument parser. And let's talk about that at a very high level. So arg parser is just a way that I can actually specify a value of something into my code and then I can use that code to process some type of logic. And as I said, in this case, what I'm gonna be passing as part of this is I'm gonna pass the YAML file with my device configuration details that I wanna have processed against that template. And the way that it is, I'm not gonna read through every one of these lines, but the two that I wanna call out is the second line down, so parser.add argument. And what I'm doing here is this is what I'm defining as an argument that I'll pass in as that command structure. And what I'm passing in is my dash F or my dash dash file. This is going to be the flag that I'll use when I'm executing this code to essentially to tell the code what the value that I'm passing back in. So I'll do dash F in the file name. And if I don't specify what I have in the next line, if we see this, this uh, comma at the end, required equals true, is essentially I'm saying when I execute this file, so this uh, ex6 underscore yaml underscore data dot py, when I execute this Python script, if I, if I don't pass in the dash F, Essentially, it's gonna generate an error. This is a mandatory field when I go to execute this file. And then what happens through this, I do some parsing of that information, and the output that it has, I've got this variable at the bottom for file name, and essentially what that is gonna say is my file name is gonna equal that flag or that, that argument that I passed in from the command line. So let's take a look at kind of what that configuration looks like. So if we take a look, I've got my device's structure that's in place, and again, I've got two files in this case because we're gonna run it, our code against file one and run our code against file two. And again, it's a structured input. I've got a device name, I've got some access information around those devices, and then underneath that, I have my interfaces and my individual instances. 
When I read this in, ultimately what YAML generates when I read this in is very similar to those variables that I defined in examples four and five, that I have a variable for interfaces and within that I have individual list instances that represent those individual interfaces. So let's take the next step down as we walk through this. My next level, so I'm going to open that YAML file and I'm going to read it in. So with open file name, and I get that file name from ARD parses that's passed in, and I'm gonna call this F. I'll create a variable for YAML data and I'm going to do yaml.safeload. And safeload is actually new, and I think in the latest release of YAML, if you've played around with it at all, you, you should be able to just do yaml.load. It generates an error message. So now I'm using yaml.safeload, f.read. So I'm going to read in all of that information. So now I have my YAML structure that's in place. And then it's down, and again, because this piece of code doesn't necessarily change, I'm just kind of looking at it as a single piece. So again, with open, so I'm calling in my specific a uh, uh, template file that I'm using in this case, and I'm gonna read in that template file. And then what I'll do for my next level down is for device in YAML data. Now, the reason why I have this, I'm only specifying one specific device as part of this config, is, is in my YAML file, but I could have, say I wanted to run this change across devices one, two, and three. Essentially what that would create is that would create a list of devices, and then you know, under each one of those lists of devices, I would have lists of interfaces. So essentially, I'm just going to iterate over that list of devices, and I'm going to pass in the variables that are from, on a, from each device under the interfaces list. So that's why I kind of have this interfaces equals device in the, my bracket for interfaces. Essentially, just for each device in my YAML file, I'm going to pass in the information under the interfaces list that's in place. And I've got another variable that's specified for the file name because we'll just see that as part of the output. And again, we'll process that output. So again, we're not gonna really look at the template because the template is, should look very familiar to what we're doing. What I wanna show in this case though is if we actually take a look at our data output, the data output is the exact same thing. The only thing that's different is again, when I executed it with file data underscore one, I got the output on the left-hand side. When I executed the file against uh, underscore YAML data, YAML underscore data two, I get the output on the right-hand side. What we're really showing here is that now, rather than having my, my data input or output that I want directly within my configuration, I can actually feed that information in through a structured data set with YAML. And again, if we look at this, this is our code, and we are finally at a point that our code is dry. I have now written my interface configuration template that I have. I can execute this off of anything that I feed in using the defined template that I can, and if I need to modify that template, I've got the ability to modify it. I can execute this code and I can make configurations on our device. All right, so let's summarize Jinja right now. We'll take, start taking a look at TextFSM in just a moment. So Jinja is a templating language for Python. It is frankly, it's the de facto templating language really when we start looking at device level CLI configuration. It's a very simple structure for variable substitutions. That's our double curlies, that's our variable. We're just gonna pass in a substitution for that information. And we get additional functionality through loops and conditionals as part of our overall, overall command structure. With that, we're now gonna transition from configuration details to how we can actually work with operational details. And, and I'm actually uh, much more interested in actually working with operational detail as we tend to not make a lot of changes in our network. We tend to actually though troubleshoot or read in a lot of information. TextFSM is the tool that we use to do that. And I think probably the best way to explain kind of where TextFSM fits is to talk about probably something that we've all been asked for. So we've probably all been in a scenario where our boss has come to us and said, hey, by the end of the day today, I need a list of every device uh, running on the network. I need to know how long they've been running, the software version that's in place, and what their serial number is. And by the way, I need that by the end of the day. And while there are tools like NetMiko, and we'll talk about NetMiko in a moment, that allow to give me programmatic access to a device, I still run a show version and I have to get this information passed back to me. And what comes back is a bunch of text, and then I have to parse all that information out. It's not an easy task to do. So enter text FSM. And TextFSM is a, an open source project created by Google. Again, Google has a massive number of CLI devices. And again, this is any vendor, any CLI, essentially they talk about this idea of semi-structured inputs because when I run a show command, I know what the structure of that data coming back is. I just don't have an easy way to parse it. That's this idea of semi-structured. And again, specifically designed with CLI devices. And the template is nothing more than a series of rules on how I wanna parse out that data to pull out the relevant pieces of information that I need. So text FSM is really built into two pieces. I have my text input. Again, I've got to feed something into the parser to run through, and I can do this a couple of different ways. We'll see one example where I'm actually just going to pass in a file with my show output that's tied to it. 
But then we'll also talk about how we can use something like NetMiko to actually go out and send the command to our device, pull in that information and parse through that in a more programmatic fashion. And then I've got the template file. And at a high level, the template is nothing more than the series of rules that I'm going to use to evaluate and parse the data. Now, one of the interesting things is, again, because I have semi-structured input, essentially to get that structured output, I have a direct marrying of kind of CLI command and template that's associated to it. So if I'm gonna try and look at my show IP interface brief, and I wanna just pull out maybe IP address and, my, and uh, whether the interface is up or not, I'm gonna have a specific template that I'm gonna to use to execute across that. So I can't really define one template and use that for everything in my environment. But I'm gonna parse back that information. It's gonna be, and again, I took this directly out of Google, uh, from Google. Parse data is returned as a tabular rep or representation. Really what it comes out is it ends up looking like a list in our environment. And unfortunately, our rules are defined in reg regex because if we're gonna parse through that information, regex is the tool set that we have. Now, I will make this statement. Regex is hard. If your only point of reference of dealing with regex is BGP, you're probably saying, Brian, you're, over, you're overstating it. But as we're gonna see in the next, next example, when I start trying to pull some information on a natural language, it gets really complex really quickly. There's a URL here on this page. There's a bunch of URLs that we'll talk about at the end of the presentation. There's tool sets that are out there to help you get started. We're gonna kind of talk through the logic of some of this as well. But just understand, let's not oversimplify this. This is regex at the end of the day. So let's take a look at the template. So we're gonna use another punk rock example. In this case, we're gonna talk about Black Flag as opposed to, uh, to the Ramones. Black Flag, seminal punk band out of California from the, the early 80s, my, my hands down favorite. Um, but our template is kind of broken down into two pieces. So it's the two pieces. The, the first piece is the value. The values are nothing more than the relevant data that I want to pull out of the text string. So in this case, our script is going to pull out the name and the instrument that someone plays in Black Flag. So our input is going to be natural language, kind of the inverse of, of the Ramones example. I'm going to say Henry Rollins is the singer, Greg Ginn plays the guitar. I'm going to pass in, pass in that information and I want to strip out their name and their, and their instrument because maybe I want to dump this into say a database so I can track all of the, the bands that other people have played in at certain points in time. So my value, this is what's relevant or important to me. And then after my values, this is again, this is going to be my, my state, which is the definitions that I'm going to use to parse the data. So I'm gonna have a series, and in this case, we only have one state, I'm gonna, but I could have multiple lines of, you know, if we take a look at say that, that example for Shover, I've got a bunch of different outputs. I may have a, a, a series of different rules that I want to parse out that information. So the rule always starts with the, uh, with the caret, and the format is gonna be in the format of, I've got a regex, and if there's a matching regex, what do I wanna do with the values that I found from that information? I got things that I can do like record, continue, go to the next line, et cetera, on down the line. So we talk about breaking down this template. We're just gonna use one line. Henry Rollins is the singer. And again, just keep in mind that every regex con condition starts with a backslash, okay? So for the purpose of this, kind of the key that we'll use is a backslash, backslash lowercase s matches a white space backslash capital S plus matches anything not matched by the previous example. So again, it's either white space or not white space. And W plus is one or more word characters. So again, it's gonna be a word, not a number is, is the bigger piece that we have here. So if we talk about this first value, and this is gonna be the person's name. So the individual in the band, their name, we've got this, this value is defined as person. And what we're matching is any non-white space followed by a white space, followed by a non-white space, or a name. A name is a word, a space, and a word. Very simple from that perspective. My second value in this case is I'm gonna match exactly one of these four, uh, one of these four pieces. So again, I've got a singer, guitar, bass, or drum that I have in place. So again, if there was a keyboardist, it wouldn't match from that perspective. My next line, this is gonna be my series of rule or my rule that I have in place. So from the start of the line, I expect to see a, a non-white space, a white space and a non-white space. That's gonna match and I'm gonna pull that value out that matches the person. I'm gonna process across it a white space, a word, a white space, a word, a white space. So that's kind of that is the blank that comes after that, a blank is the blank. And then the next value that's gonna come in, I'm gonna exactly match that value for instrument. And I'll record that information out, and that's where I got that list of name and instrument that they play. So let's talk about this in terms of kind of a little bit more configuration piece. So we're running short on time. I, well, no, actually, I do want to. I want to cover example one. I want to make sure that we get this. So in this example, what we're doing is again we're going to bring in uh, text FSM. 
So the first thing I have to do is I have to read in the text to parse. And in this example, I'm actually, this is just a file that I've got my show IP interface brief output into. So again, I'm not gonna programmatically try and generate this, this is just a text file. So I'm gonna read in that information. The next is I'm gonna open that template and parse the text. So in this case, I'm pulling in four values, my interface name, my IP address, its status and its protocol. My status, so it's up, down, at, or admin down. This would be my shut level of that, that piece. And then my protocol piece is whether my protocol is up or down or is the cable plugged in or not. And I'm gonna pull all this information out. I'm gonna parse that information. So with my template, ex one ship templatetextfsm I'm gonna create essentially my regex table that I have. And then I'm gonna parse my data through that regex table. And my output that I get here is again, is interface name, IP address, and then my, my individual up, down, around those individual pieces. So again, very simple example from this. Now, as I said, regex is hard. We don't really like working with regex. And if we had to go through and write that regex to meet that host name, serial number, iOS version, and uptime, you would probably tell me, Brian, I could just attach to these devices and pull the information out a little bit easier. So let's talk about how we can go about this from a programmatic standpoint. And if I were to tell you that we could also do this without having to provide any level of regex as part of our config. So let's break it up. This is a little bit difficult to do. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is this first import that we're gonna bring in is we're gonna bring in the NetMiko library. So NetMiko is a Python library created by Kirk Byers. So there's a, there'll be a link to this at the end. But what NetMiko allows us to do is essentially creates a standardized structure for creating an SSH session to a device and then either sending show commands or sending configuration details and getting information back. It's somewhat of a combination between kind of uh, of a session establishment as well as like a, an expect script or something similar coming back from that. It's a real simple way to start interacting with devices on the network. But one of the cool things that we start talking about NetMiko is NetMiko has a built-in library or a built-in function that's tied to that that allows you to specifically call some pre-built text FSM templates created by an organization called Network to Code. And again, Network to Code is Jeremy Edelman's uh, organization that's really trying to help drive automation to customer environments. So what we have to do is to actually access this, and we'll talk about kind of how we pull this information together, but I have to tell NetMiko or my, my Python script using NetMiko where I can find those Python or where I can find those, those text FSM scripts. So I'm gonna use OS to specify that path. I'm actually gonna pass in an environment variable. So my first line with open device details YAML. So this is what I'm gonna use for all of my session establishment. We'll take a look at that on the next slide. And it's, I'm gonna pass in these environment variables. So my environment variable is net underscore text FSM. And what that is gonna provide is that's gonna provide a path to the GitHub or where I pulled down the GitHub repository for all these text FSM, uh, uh, all of the text FSM, excuse me, templates as well as an index file. And we'll talk about the index file in the next slide. So within each one, or within the YAML file, I've got uh, connection details to the device. So we kind of look at this next line down. I'm gonna, create, I'm gonna loop through uh, all of the individual devices that are from that YAML file. And I'm gonna use this idea of connection handler. So connection handler is, is a function that's part of the NetMiko library that's going to be used to establish my connection. So I'm gonna pass in uh, my iOS version, my device IP address, my username, my password, and my SSH port. And I'm gonna define all of these values to, to this variable of ch. And then my next line down, I'm gonna use this show ver output. In this case, so I'm gonna send show ver, or show ver output is equal. So using everything associated with ch, so all those session details, I'm going to send the command show version to the device that I'm attached to. And in my case, I have two devices that we're gonna execute this against. And then the next argument, use text FSM equals true. So what happens in this case is that the, the NetMiko library will then look for the net FSM environment variable that will tell him where the templates are in that index file. And that index file marries the show command that I'm sending to a specific text FSM template. So when I see show version, or frankly, if I could send show ver, the, the NetMiko library will do a lookup in the index to understand, well, this show command should use this, this text FSM template so I can use that essentially to parse that semi-structured data out to get me back to a list that I can now work with. This is a structured data set that I can work with. And what I'm gonna generate is, that comes out of that is for each one of these individual devices in my YAML file, I'm gonna, prevent, I'm gonna print the device host name, I'm gonna print the device serial number, I'll print out the device version, and I'm gonna print out the device uptime. So if we take a look at the output from that perspective, 
Four device, iOS XE1. I've got my serial number is 9XYR3, my iOS version of 1691, and my uptime is one day, 18 hours, and 13 minutes. So I run that information through and I pass that, that data through text FSM. I can parse that onto my print statement. Then I will go back to the top of that, that YAML file, I'll find the next device in the list, and I'll process all this information back through where I see my next line down. And the beauty of this, by using NetMeco in the, in the, the Network to Code text FSM libraries, is I didn't have to write one line of regex. I had to go in and actually understand what the values that were being parsed out of that, and I should be able to do that as a network engineer. But the, I was able to actually build all that information out, and I could actually validate this information as part of the network. Where this really becomes powerful is when I do something like Jinja to build my configuration, and then I use text FSM to do something simple like, I don't know, validate that what I wanted to have configured on the device actually was configured on the device. And to that point, this code is dry. In fact, in this case, I'm not even passing in the template that I'm using in this scenario. All that I'm really passing in is this show version. And we could take the, we could abstract this one step further. We could actually pass in the show command that we wanted as part of an argument, you know, that arg parse piece. We could pass that, that value back as part of this, again, as long as we've got that matching index file. But this is an operational code snippet that's dry. We, we've completely pulled out any level of, of textual data that we needed to provide to this functionality. All right, so in summary, TextFSM, it's an open source project by Google. There's a, there'll be a link to this at the end. And we take semi-structured data because we know that our show outputs on our devices, they're semi-structured. We, we know what we should expect that's coming back as part of that. Our templates are defined as a series of rules. They're written in regex. Don't, you don't have to memorize regex. There's a bunch of phenomenal tools. I'll talk about a couple of those coming up in a moment. But what comes back part of that is structured data that I can now work with or I can actually pull in to report on something that's meaningful for me to work with. So what did we talk about today? We talked about the dry principle, and really at its core is that the idea behind dry is don't repeat yourself. We're trying to move towards writing smaller snippets of code that are reusable, so I can call them in different places as, as part of my, my script that I'm building out. But more importantly, we also wanna start separating our configuration from our data as part of our overall command set. So no longer do we wanna stick our variables directly in, our, in the code, we wanna leverage things like templates to, to create this functionality. And our reusable code is really kind of built into three pieces. I need a scripting language, so that's Python or Ansible or NSO or something similar to that perspective. I have a templating language, and we learned about Jinja for CLI and TextFSM for operational details. And then I need a way to actually provide some structured data that kind of comes back into that, that process. And we talked about YAML as really the tool set for, the, for uh, leveraging kind of that structured data for doing our variable replacements. So as I promised through the course of this presentation, we've got a ton of resources that are available to you. This first section around docs and links, these are really just uh, links to specifically the Python libraries that we talked about, Jinja, Text, FSM, and NetMeco, as well as a link to the Network to Code, Text, FSM templates that are available. But additionally, I want to call out this developer.cisco.com Python link. And again, this is kind of the Python documentation that's available on developer.cisco.com. Um, as I said, I don't typically, I don't come from a traditional, you know, programming background. I have a lot of self-learning. This is where I started and, and when I started going on this journey two years ago when Hank reached out to me and asked me to do that session that we kind of kicked this whole conversation off with. Um, we talked about regex. Regex is very hard. We don't need to memorize it any longer. This isn't our IE lab. We need to walk in with this massive amount of information. We're going to go out to web pages and we're going to look at it. Uh, regexr.com is a great resource for regex, a, more of a documentation set. Um, I like this second link, and it's actually a link to uh, to a university in, in Singapore that actually has an interactive regex uh, tool, so you can actually provide your regex strings and what comes back is more natural language. Back to that example that I gave where it's, you know, white space, uh, uh, non-white space, white space, kind of explains what it is that your regex is parsing through. A couple of learning labs as well, as, as I mentioned, where I started were the DevNet learning labs. I can't stress these enough. If you're new to, to programmability, if a lot of the topics I talked about today, if you looked at the code that I generated and thought, Brian, this is way too hard, I'm never gonna be able to wrap my head around it, I'm gonna highly recommend you go take a look at the learning labs. And there are two that are here. The first is the laptop setup. And I, I actually suggest that people kind of start with this because it does a good job of actually explaining all of these various tools that you might use. But then what we can take that is if we have the tool sets in place on our laptop, we can start doing something like coding fundamentals to get our hands on as part of this information. I'm also hoping to get some of this information together up there as, as a learning lab on developer.cisco.com. 
The DevNet always on sandboxes, so if you're not familiar with the sandboxes, they are resources that Cisco makes available that you can actually test your code against. So there's a couple of routers that are in place for always, always on routers uh, in place. You can actually send commands against it. These are typically gonna be most uh, read-only command sets though. And then two code samples today. We talked about all of the examples we use in the lab today. I've got a GitHub repository for that, cs.co gin fsm guide. But the other one I also want to call out is if you think all the way back to how we kicked this off and how I wrote that script for Cisco Live to provision my routers for, for uh, starting up those lab sessions and, and how I said it, you know, it was really specifically for a task. The outcome that came out of that is I actually created this provision guest shell script that will automate the, the configuration of a router as well as enable guest shell, which allows us to, to run some Python code directly on the router. And I've posted this up to not only to GitHub, I posted it up to the code exchange. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Code Exchange, Code Exchange is a resource on DevNet that allows you to actually search a repository for people that may have submitted you know, code pieces that they've written to spit, fix specific projects. But more importantly, it gives you an opportunity when you sit down and figure something out, you can submit it so that other individuals within the community have an opportunity to use it. Now the question always comes in, well, what do I submit? And I'm gonna give you an idea here. So what I'm gonna ask that's coming out of this, we learned about Jinja today, we learned about TextFSM. The code exchange challenge that I'm gonna push out to you today is to actually leverage something that we learned today. So take one of these reoccurring common configuration tasks that we have to do in our network and automate it. All I'm asking you to do is I'm not gonna ask you to write a script that's gonna go out and query the router and maybe push all these configuration changes out, but take one of those common reoccurring tasks, use Jinja to create a template for that, con the con that configuration snippet, feed in the variables and generate that CLI output so you can paste into the device the next time you run it. And for the bonus challenge that's on top of that is after you paste that configuration in, use TextFSM to actually query the device. Maybe you want to use NetMiko with this as well to, to query that device and validate that the change made actually did what you wanted it to. Once that's all done, get it all packaged up, submit it off to, to Code Exchange. You can send it to me. I'll provide you some contacts and information as well. Happy to provide you some feedback. It might be something I want to use as part of in my environment as well. So if you're looking for some additional information on Net DevOps, again, like we keep saying uh, DevOps or uh, DevNet over and over again, uh, developer.cisco.com, Net DevOps is the URL for that, uh, for details kind of around the, the whole process. Net DevOps Live, and specifically the, the sessions that we're doing as part of this, you can get the URLs here are really cs.co forward slash NDL, really easy to remember. We've got blogs and some net, uh, basic network programmability videos done by our host, Hank Preston. They're phenomenal resources. And lastly, if you have any additional questions, you all should have been added to the WebEx Teams room that's tied to part of this, but stay in touch. You can reach out directly. Uh, my, my Teams address is there, bryburn at cisco.com. For the more savvy of us that are on this call, understand that's also an email address. You can get to me a little bit more uh, traditional methodology. You can find me at Twitter at brian.25607. I post up things around network programmability, also a little bit around Ohio State Buckeyes, because again, that's my other passion in life. And as well as my GitHub repository, github.com, Bryburn, you can reach out to me there, as well as the same contact details that are available for DevNet. And with that, I greatly appreciate everyone taking the time to sit with us today as we went through this information. I know I ran a little bit uh, long today, but greatly appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to the next session coming up next week. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Brian, for an excellent session today. I mean, you crammed so much great content in, but I'm going to give you so much credit because you also walked us through it in a very obvious and clear fashion to introduce two really important topics to every network automation engineer as we're starting to move down this path to take things out of just the lab and experimentation and into real world use cases in our environment. So I encourage everybody to take Brian's code exchange challenge and build yourself a template, build yourself a text FSM verification and go forward. Well, thank you all for joining us on today's episode of NetDevOps Live. We'll be back next week with another episode here in season two. I will see you then. Thanks everybody.